You know, guys, I say I'm not brand biased, but I'm going to be honest with you. The F450 is just an amazing looking truck. That said, that's not what this video is about. We're going to talk about RVs. And this is an important topic because even though I'm not going to be walking around a ton of different RVs to talk about this, I think the point I'm going to make is going to be crystal clear by the time you're done watching this video. And a lot of folks ask me this question, so don't just forward through this one because this one's going to be important if you're shopping for an RV. Hang tight. I'll be right back. So here it is, our 2022 Coachman Brookstone. Um, we've had it for a while now. We've probably taken it out maybe 24 times since we've had it, two dozen times. Uh, we haven't taken it out nearly as often as we would have liked to. And, you know, that's just kind of part of the gig here. When you do YouTube, you got a lot of stuff to, to do content on. I got to do RV reviews. I got to do truck reviews. I got a, a Palomino Paws sitting over here that I do reviews on. And I also have a life. I have a family. And, and, you know, sometimes you don't take these things out as much as you'd like to. That said, though, a recurring question that I often get is should I buy a certain brand over another brand? And this is questions that, that you guys ask me all the time. I get them in my, uh, in my inbox, I get them in the comment section. And somebody basically says that I'm shopping for a fifth wheel, I have a $75,000 budget, um, I have a family, um, I'm looking at a Jayco unit, or I'm looking at a Grand Design unit, or I'm looking at a Heartland unit, or you know, a one of uh, a number of different brands out there. And most of the time, the question that I'm asked is in regards to an RV that has an MSRP anywhere between about 100 to $125,000, but a sale price between about 65 and $90,000. So it's right in the middle of that that most popular large fifth wheel, but not super expensive, not super cheap area, right? It's right in the middle there. And I would venture to say that most people who are looking for a fifth wheel, a large fifth wheel, typically are shopping, at least today, in that 60 to 85 to $90,000 range. That's what they're willing to actually finance and spend on a fifth wheel. There's a lot of folks that will, you know, I shop $160,000, $170,000 units that sell for $120,000 to $140,000. And they may like some of the perks, but they may not be able to actually afford those units. So again, 60 to about $90,000, 60 to 85, $90,000 is the typical range that most people are shopping for whenever they're shopping for a luxury fifth wheel, full size fifth wheel, typically a full profile fifth wheel, sometimes with a full profile roof going all the way back. Now, the question again, I'm asked very often is, should I get this one brand over another? Should I get, you know, a certain floor model over another? And you know, if you watch the videos I put out on brands like Brinkley, which is a phenomenal brand, beautiful brand, um, you're going to see that in order to stay in that price range, you're going to have to go for their lower mid-profile series fifth wheel, which is by all accounts a luxury fifth wheel just in a mid-profile kind of a smaller package. Um, if you're going for these really long 40 to 44 foot long fifth wheels, full profile fifth wheels, well, Brinkley doesn't have an offering there unless you're going to get a toy hauler. And that toy hauler is going to be very expensive. It's going to be over $100,000. That's what you're actually going to spend on it at the end of the day. Not the MSRP, which is going to be well over that, but the actual cost you'll end up financing. So again, I'm not focused on mid-profile. I'm not focused on more compact fifth wheels. I'm focused on full profile fifth wheels in that sixty dollars to $85,000, $90,000 price range. Now, why am I making this video? Because... Yes, you can look at a certain brand like Brinkley and say, man, they're using wiring harnesses, they're, the process of how they assemble their unit, the windows, all of this stuff is super cool. But again, if you want to actually get one in that price range, you're looking at a mid-profile smaller unit. If you're looking for a large fifth wheel, they don't have that in that price range. You're going to have to jump up to their toy hauler, and again, that'll be over the price. So if you're shopping for a fifth wheel that uses a wiring harness and you think that that is absolutely the type of quality I need to get a fifth wheel, unfortunately, I can't think of any brand that makes a full profile, super long fifth wheel that's going to fall into that price range. And I can't think of any brand that is going to completely stand out against all the others in that price range. Now, you could look at a brand like Alliance and you could say they're doing things differently because they certainly are. They have some really, really great reasons why you should look at their products, but they're also not using wiring harnesses. They're doing color-coded wiring, which is really nice and it's great for tracing down issues, but they're not using wiring harnesses. Now, why do I keep harping on this whole wiring harness bit? It's because oftentimes people have an expectation 
that if I'm going to get a quality RV, it has to have a certain feature. It has to have hydraulic leveling system. It has to have, it has to utilize all rack and pinion slides. It can't have Schwinn Tech or cable driven or slim rack. It has to have um, a wiring harness system in it. It has to have all these different features that make you believe that's what you need to have in order for it to be a quality RV. Now, the interesting thing here is that I don't disagree with you on some of those. I believe that there's some components that are higher quality than other components. But I also believe you should understand that many of the techniques used to build RVs aren't bad, even if they're not what you think they should be. Let me give you an example of that. Not utilizing a wiring harness or color-coded wiring, does that automatically make the RV you get bad? Nope. Not at all. There's a lot of folks that are, are riding around in Pumas, which are a very, very affordable RV or super low cost RVs. They don't have wiring harnesses. The wires are ran through the chassis just like everything else. The chances that a wire is going to chafe against something enough to, it, to where it actually cuts through is pretty, pretty dang slim. I mean, very, 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 very low percentage of that actually happening. So utilizing a wiring harness to fix that problem isn't necessarily a problem you're fixing. You're moving to a, yes, a better, I guess, fit and finish, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's gonna last longer or it's gonna have fewer problems because very rarely do RVs have wiring harness problems unless the wire itself was pinched between two surfaces and it was cut into during the manufacturing process. Very rarely will an RV just being pulled down the road have a wiring harness failure, unless maybe it wasn't crimped properly or the splice that they used wasn't the right splice or it wasn't tightened properly or just something like that. Basically, as it goes down the assembly line, somebody didn't do something correctly. Rarely are you gonna have an issue with a wire just sitting on something, bouncing enough to where it's gonna cut through that wire and ground out. And even if that potential does exist, it's such a rare chance of that actually happening that I would argue to say you're gonna have some other component that could potentially fail before something like that occurs. Now, I bring this topic up Again, not just around wiring harnesses, but around the whole RV in general, because there's so many hands that put together an RV. But the reality is the quality of the RV you get are based on really two factors. The first one being the quality of the components that were put into it and how they arrived at the factory. So let me give you an example. If you're attaching axles to an RV and you're buying your axles from Dexter or Moride or Lippert, in Moride's case, it's not really an axle, but you know what I mean. But if you're buying your components from them and there's some hidden flaw or defect in that component and it gets put on your RV the correct way, you could experience a failure in that component that has nothing to do with the manufacturer of the RV itself, such as tires. Let's say you buy Goodyear tires and they're Goodyear endurance tires and you expect them to be phenomenal tires and they may be great tires normally, but the one specific tire that is on the one axle position on your specific RV has some type of a manufacturer's defect to it, and that causes that tire to fail. Well, regardless of what brand of RV you buy, that tire could fail across any of them. Another example might be your automatic leveling system. Perhaps there's a flaw in the specific system that was installed on your specific RV that day. Well, again, that doesn't have anything to do with the manufacturer. They could have tested it, you know, 200 times, but it failed for you because that component was on the verge of failing at that point, right? So let's use another example of that. Let's say wire. Maybe the manufacturer who actually makes the wire itself uh, did something at some point during the manufacturing process which caused the wire to have a kink or a break in it that just wasn't identifiable because the shielding over the wire covered it up. Again, it may make you think that it's a manufacturing issue of the RV, but it's really a problem with the manufacturer who produced the wire. And I bring this up because when you're shopping for an RV and you're asking me, what is the best one I should go for? I have these two very similar floor plans from two different manufacturers. Which one should I buy? The things that I point out in my videos when I talk about rack and pinion versus cable driven slides or electronic uh, landing gear and auto leveling versus hydraulic or a pin box or Asdell versus Luan or, you know, TPO versus a PVC roof. 
all these things that I bring up are really just talking to you about what that manufacturer uses, not necessarily telling you that one's gonna be superior over another because there's no way of truly knowing. The, the second factor that goes into RVs, of course, is the crew that assembled your RV. If you had a crew that arrived in the morning, they're refreshed, they just had breakfast, they're all in really good moods and they're really hustling and they're really doing their best to put together a quality product. And then in the evening or later in the week, you have a crew that is super bummed out. They're just not working as hard. They're not doing the job the same way as that other crew. Well, naturally there's a higher likelihood that some part may not be installed properly or some part might make its way through quality control unchecked. Now, brands like Brinkley, which do a great job of you know, really maintaining quality control all the way across their assembly line, as well as brands like Alliance and many other brands. It's not just those two. A lot of brands really step it up in terms of checking the RV as it goes down the assembly line. Well, you, there's things you can catch and then there's things you can't catch. There's things you just may not see. As good as a brand can be, there may be some other issue with something that, that was just missed. And the reason why it's hard for me to just blatantly jump out and say, well, this one brand that you're looking at in this price range is better than another brand you're looking at in this price range is because I don't know all those variables. I have no way of knowing. It's, it's hard to know specifically what is going to be a thing that could potentially fail, that could potentially go wrong. That's why I usually don't give recommendations on brands. A lot of people email me. Um, I get over seven to 800 comments every week. Uh, a lot of folks asking me questions. I get a lot of emails, about 300 emails a week. And people are saying, I'm shopping for this brand. We're gonna be living in it full time. Should we get it over another brand? A good example of this is my collaboration with the folks over at Coachman to design this Brookstone, the 398 MBL, which was a true collaboration with me and Coachman. It didn't mean that the product we got as closely as this thing was scrutinized was perfect. I've shown you all the videos where I've had to fix things. I probably cut 200 yards of extra wire out that didn't need to be there. I fixed a panel behind the door because the electrical was a little finicky. I had to completely have the brake system redone because there were issues with how it was installed. It doesn't mean I even get a perfect product, even though this, this unit spent a lot more time on the, the line than any other unit, and it had a lot more hands and eyes on it, it doesn't mean it's to be perfect and i simply tell you this because if your expectations are that you're going to buy one brand over another brand and you really want someone to tell you that the brand you're looking at is better than the other one it's going to be really difficult to quantify that now there are some really high-end brands out there like your luxes and again you could even qualify brinkley as part of that or even your drvs that there are more hands that are also inspecting these units, but it still doesn't mean that a failure can't happen, whether the unit is being pulled down the road and something just occurs that wasn't foreseen, or perhaps there was a lapse in some type of quality control that took place. At the end of the day, whenever you're buying an RV, there are risks. And I'm just being honest with you. There are risks that you could end up with a model that has a lot of problems. There are risks that you could end up with a model that has very, very few problems. There are risks that you could end up with a model that has maybe one major problem and no minor problems or a bunch of minor problems and no major problems. For us, you know, we kind of had a mixture of some of that. The only major thing I thought was the brake system and that was all addressed, but there were a bunch of small minor things, but I don't think any of them were outside of the realm of what we were prepared for getting into any RV. And I think that that is ultimately what you have to ask yourself. If you're buying an RV, regardless of the brand that you're buying, are you in the mindset of someone who's prepared to fix minor things, perhaps be patient while some major things get addressed, and I guess at the end of the day, have the patience to understand that things are going to happen. They, they just will. As much as you want to leave a comment right now saying it shouldn't because I'm paying $90,000 for this RV, it should be perfect. You know, I don't disagree with you. I, if we lived in a perfect world, I think that that would be a great expectation. But the reality of it is it's not going to happen. You're not going to have a perfect RV no matter how much you pay, no matter how, how much you want it to be perfect. You're like, you know what? I didn't buy a $40,000 RV. I bought a $90,000 RV because I knew the $90,000 RV was going to be built better. That's not how it works. It may have better perks. It may have better features. It may use some better materials, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be a perfect unit. And you have to be willing to understand that. So for those of you who send me an email and say, I'm looking at this model versus this model, they're both in the same price category, have a similar floor plan, which one do you think I should get? 
I'm never gonna answer that question. I can't answer that question. My only opinion would be, look at other brands, look at all the brands you can that have a floor plan that you're interested in, and walk through them all and see which one in your opinion, based on what you can identify and inspect, has the features, the construction perks, and appears to have the quality that you're looking for. And that should be the RV you look at. Bringing an inspector into it isn't a bad idea because they can look at things that you may not be familiar with or have expertise in. So that's also really important. And again, we're looking at my Brookstone in particular because it's not a perfect unit. You know, it hasn't been. We've had little issues with it, but at least um, I feel like I went into it with the understanding that we would. As twisted as that may sound to some folks, if you have never owned an RV, if you haven't really followed the lifestyle before, if you really don't understand what it takes to build an RV, the different hands that are touching it, the very, very manual process of putting it together, it's gonna be hard for you to grasp the fact that something that costs you upward of $100,000 is gonna have problems. But, you know, all those analogies people say, it's a hurricane, an earthquake, and a tornado all in one when you pull it down the road, they're true. Those sayings happen because they're true. And you have to be prepared for it. Anyways, guys, I sure hope you enjoyed this video. I know it's not the typical topic we talk about, but I think it's one that's very important to understand and wrap your mind around, especially as you watch all these different YouTubers who review RVs, including myself. We, um, we just know what you buy when you buy an RV. And you may say you're buying crap, you may say you're buying a junky product, but you may say I'm buying a project, but I'm also buying something that my family's gonna spend a lot of time in and build some really great memories with the understanding that I'm probably gonna have some things I'm gonna have to deal with. Guys, hope you enjoyed the video. If you haven't had a chance, please subscribe to the channel. Give me a thumbs up. We'll talk to you again real soon.